This session of the Reversing Diabetes program is our fourth, and it's entitled Proteins That Heal. Guta said, we are best at hiding those things that are in plain sight. And Dr. Joel Furman says, nothing is so hidden as the untold story of protein. So let me try to put together some ideas about protein. Questions. What are good sources of protein? How much protein do I need? Plant protein versus animal protein. What's a good quality protein? What are the best supplements? What are the best sources? What kind of impacts do proteins have on diabetes? Well, when we're talking about proteins, one of the first things we run into is actually a cultural bias. For many years in America now, we have equated with meat on the table with being, being equal to prosperity. And if you were rich, you ate meat. But if you were poor, you ate plant foods. That's a sad thing. And if I ate plant foods, then I, I'm lazy. And we need to dispel those myths. T. Colin Campbell has an impressive story to tell. He became a part of the global effort to end world hunger, which was going on in the 1960s and 1970s. Governments and universities from all around the world were trying to uh, end this world hunger. And they felt that malnutrition was simply due to a lack of protein. So Dr. Campbell, in the early years, was sent to the Philippines in order to uh, be a portion of this. And he was trying, working with the U.S. Agency for International Development, trying to get protein, as much protein as possible, to be available for the children. Well, in the coastal areas, within 50 miles or so of the coast, that wasn't a problem. But transportation over there was poor. And to get it inland was, was a big problem. So they began to try to do it inland with peanuts. Peanuts are high in protein. And one of the problems they ran into was peanuts would often become contaminated with an aflatoxin. And uh, this aflatoxin is one of the most carcinogenic substances known to man. It comes from a mold that gets on, grows on uh, peanuts that haven't been dried quite enough. So he had a dual problem that he was working with. Number one, how to produce more protein. Number two, how to pre prevent aflatoxin contamination. And of course, he knew that aflatoxin causes cancer, liver cancer. Up to that point in time, they believed that uh, liver cancer rates were highest in countries with lowest protein intakes. And so they naturally believed that liver cancer was caused by a protein deficiency. Well, while he was working there in the Philippines, one of the physicians pointed out to him that it was the people from the wealthiest families who had a 20% or greater protein intake. It was those people who had the highest rate of liver cancer. And then he read a report in a little obscure magazine from India in which they reported that people with the highest protein intake had the highest liver cancer rates and people with the low protein, lowest protein intake had the lowest liver cancer rate. It was around that time his mother died of cancer. So he decided to change his career emphasis and take this information that he had pondered and test it out in the laboratory. And so he went to Cornell University and began his work there. While there, he met Dr. Junshi Chen, who was a distinguished senior scientist from China. And they had just completed what they called a, a cancer atlas, where they had mapped cancer rates uh, from all over the, the nation of China and uh, had more than 650,000 participants in this study. And uh, the, the cancer rates they noted in one county, from one county to the next, would vary very widely. So they, they designed a study and set it up as a joint effort between the US government and the Chinese government. They felt like this was the only place remaining on Earth where people would live and die within a 50 mile radius of home. And they would be able to, I mean, they would they ate what was grown there largely, 
and the disease rates varied by sometimes more than 100 times from one place to another. So they went in with their research team. They collected more than 1,000 pieces of information off of these people, and they spent a great deal of time entering that into computers, analyzing it, reanalyzing it, and then testing it in the laboratory. His work has ignited a firestorm of scientific research in every major university around the globe. His book was published in 2006 and is called The China Study. And in there he had a little graph where he showed uh, results from a study that they were doing. They took laboratory rats and they fed them varying degrees of protein. Those that had a low intake of protein, that is 5% protein intake in their diet, had a very low rate of cancer when they had been injected with the aflatoxin carcinogen. Those that were eating a higher percentage protein had a much higher, many times higher, uh, development of cancer. And he said, well, why is this? And so they began to look for different variants to try to figure out and un, un, I mean, to, to uh, untangle this puzzle. So they injected the, some, some rats with a high aflatoxin rate, but they fed them a low protein diet and they had a low foci response. They injected other rats with a low amount of aflatoxin and fed them a high protein diet and they had a high cancer response rate. So it appeared that it, uh, the cancer was linked to the protein. And they said, well, what happens when we vary the percent protein in the diet? So they started out with 5%, which is just about as low an intake of protein as you can get. And then they went to 14% and 22%. And when they tested these uh, for tumor development at 100 weeks, the problem with... Uh, the 22% group, they were all dead. The 14% group had a significant growth of cancer, and yet the 5% group had almost none. So it seemed it was a very strong correlation there. So they said, well, what is the foci response? What is the tumor growth response related to an intake of protein? Where does it take off? Where does it really grow? And so they got it down to 4%, tested that, 6%, very, very low, 8%, a little bit of growth, 10%, just a tiny bit more. And then when they went to 12%, 14%, it just jumps off the chart. And you can see what 20% does. So he called this the hockey stick effect. And they have tested a lot of other kind of things. They said, well, what, what happens? Uh, what types of proteins are there? The, what they were testing, the type of protein they were using was casein. That's a protein that's found in milk. He discovered that there are, uh, are two basic biological types of protein. One, animal protein behaves one way, regardless of what the source is, and plant protein behaves another way. So high levels of plant protein did not produce the same bi biological uh, uh, results. They were not disease promoting, and they come with higher fiber content and greater amounts of nutrients. So there were other variabilities here that they tried to, to sort out and determine. So what he did is he compared casein, 20% casein, with 20% gluten. And uh, gluten, of course, is a, a protein from wheat. And when he compared the two, he discovered that uh, he did not get the same kind of response out of the wheat protein. Uh, and then you can see how they also compared it to 5% casein, so a dramatic response between the two. So the protein from wheat didn't, uh, didn't have the same response. That brings us down to the biology of proteins. There actually seems to be a difference between animal protein and plant proteins. So you have the uh, animal proteins over here, they cause increase, as, as the intake of the animal proteins goes up, you have an increased amount of disease that happens. But as you intake animal protein, I mean plant proteins, you have no disease response. Then uh, animal proteins are full of 
high saturated fats, and plant proteins have low poly or mono unsaturated fats. You have no dietary fiber here, whereas in plants, they're, they are filled with high dietary fiber. Over here, you have low levels of antioxidants and vitamins. Over here, you have high levels of antioxidants and vi vitamins. Now, you know, when we talk about uh, these macronutrients, you don't really have the ability in nature to take a mac macronutrient and just do the macronutrient. You have to take it how it's packaged. And so when you look at the whole package, which is the better option? Well, let's look and uh, see some examples of other diseases and how they might relate to protein intake. Well, he actually repeated this study many, many times and looked at varying diseases. And what he saw was still the hockey stick effect. As you increase the protein, the instance of the disease goes up. You're looking at cancers, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, hypertension, dementia. In fact, they made in their study 8,000 associations between lifestyle, diet, and disease. Now, one of the things we encourage you to do in this course is to spend time every day um, learning how to better your health. And so once you finish learning about diabetes and you're looking for another book to read, might I recommend that you spend some time uh, studying up on Dr. Uh, Campbell's book, The China Study. I think you'll find it very interesting reading. And um, are there other studies out in science which show similar results? Well, in, the, in this particular study, it was done by R.M. Fleming and reported in 2000 in the journal Angiology. And he looked at the effect of high-protein diets on coronary blood flow. So they used a SPECT scan to directly measure blood flow. And they compared two diets. They compared a whole food plant-based diet with a low-carbohydrate, high-protein diet. This would be something like you see in the paleo diet or, uh, or the... Uh, uh, Adkins diet, et cetera. What they found was when you ate the whole, plant, uh, whole food plant-based diet, it actually increased blood flow by 40%. But when you changed over to the low carbohydrate protein diet, it actually decreased that blood flow by 40%. So there was another study that was done by uh, Walter Logo. At the, he's a... Uh, uh, one of the doctors at uh, USC Davis School of Gerontology. And he was looking specifically at uh, the consumption of proteins and the instance of disease. His report was reported in Cell Metabolism in March of 2014. And it has been known for quite some time that when you consume animal proteins, you increase insulin-like growth factor, and we call that IGF-1. IGF-1 is, known, is a known link between age-related diseases, and this may be why it is that when you consume animal proteins, you actually increase the uh, uh, instance of all of these diseases. Uh, you increase this insulin growth factor 1. And so, um, it will cause increased instance of uh, diabetes, and it will cause increased instance of cancer, as well as a number of other disease, diseases there. And when you eat uh, less animal protein and more of, the, uh, more of the plant proteins, eating less of the animal protein actually lowers the IGF-1 in the body. And uh, it comes down to a fairly low range, around 10%, and your uh, disease instance drops off significantly there. So what, doctor, um, what, what the doctor did is he looked, first of all, he compared three concentrations of protein in the diet. There was a high-protein diet, which was greater than 20% calories. Uh, and there was a moderate-protein diet, which was 10 to 20% calories, and then a low-protein diet, which was less than 10%. What they found was that in the high-protein group, there was a 74% in overall mortality over about an 18-year period in the 50 to 65 age group. 
Now, they have found out that when you move beyond 65, evidently your protein needs go up because you had a 28% reduction in overall mortality rate that they reported as well, indicating that as you get older, after, as you get past the age of 65, it might be beneficial for you to actually increase the uh, amount of protein that you take in. But he found out that there was a fourfold increase in the 50 to 65 age group of people who were dying of cancer in the high protein group as opposed to the low protein group. And also there was a five-fold risk, a 500% increase in the rate of dying from diabetes in all ages. So if you have this in all ages, five-fold increase, uh, then when you start considering uh, increasing uh, uh, your protein in your diet to get a 28% uh, reduction in mortality, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to add st start adding a lot of protein here when you're going to be dying because of the high protein there. So as, as, as people took in uh, plant proteins, as you're, when, when they didn't take in animal proteins, they did just plant proteins. What they found out is all these numbers, they became insignificant. They just dropped off the scene. So the take home to me is that if you're eating plant proteins, you're going to be much healthier. Reduce, the, reduce your animal protein intake to less than 10%. The average American eats 20 to 23% protein, so we're actually eating a little more than twice the amount of animal protein that we need. Now here's a good strategy. If you stop eating the meats and leave a little dairy or cheese in there, but use those sparingly, you've done yourself a huge favor as far as uh, allowing yourself additional length of time, additional health, additional quality of life, etc. And then you try to get more of your proteins from plants, nuts, and seeds. But as you'll learn, it's really not something that we have to worry a whole lot about. There was another study that was done. This was the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition Study. And they had a 38,000, almost 39,000 people enrolled in this study. And what they discovered was that for every 5% in which you increase your protein intake, there's a corresponding 30% increase in the risk of diabetes. Now that's huge. Another study that was done was the Adventist Health Study. In here they looked, uh, they, they ran this study on 60,000 participants and they divided the study very interestingly uh, Adventists have, have, for years, have tried to adopt a very healthful lifestyle. And so you have people all across the spectrum who belong to the faith. You have people who eat the standard American diet. You have people that have decided to try to live a little more healthfully. They cut down on their uh, meat intake. There's those that just eat milk, eggs, and fish. Who, are we, who we call pesco-vegetarians, then there's a lacto-ovo, which eats just milk and eggs from animal sources, all the rest of their intake is protein, I mean is, is plant protein, and then there's the vegan, which eat no animal proteins at all. And it's interesting when you look at the percent prevalence of diabetes, as the animal protein in the diet increases, the prevalence of diabetes increases as well. There was a paper that was written called Protein Controversies in Diabetes by Marion J. Franz. She's a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. She says, food choices that many patients make when given advice to eat protein are usually meat or meat substitutes such as cheese, peanut butter. Some may think of milk as a protein. Health professions Professionals often call these foods protein, but are they really protein? Certainly they all contain protein, but most foods that contain protein also contain fat, and a few also contain carbohydrate. So let's look at one of the tables that she posted. Now I've come along and edited 
what she did in red. I've added a few numbers here so we can actually compare serving size. Very lean meats, she lists shrimp, three ounces of shrimp, but she moves down here to lean meats and does three and a half ounces. Here she's looking at three and a half ounces. Then when she goes to high fat meats, she goes to one, uh, one ounce. So I thought, well, let's, let's put these all on a level playing field and look at that. So if you'll indulge me, let's look through here. Very lean meats. You get 83 of your calories from protein and 9 of your calories from fat. Not too bad if you're really wanting, to, uh, wanting protein. But then you look to the lean meats, things like chicken, fish, lean beef, veal, and ham. 124 calories from protein, 41 calories from fat. But when you start moving to the medium fat meats, this is things like extra lean ground beef, pork, beef roast, pork chops. Why, look at those numbers. Your calories from protein are 102. That doesn't look too bad. But look at what you're getting in the fat arena, 147 calories from fat. And then when you learn, move to high fat meats, which are the processed meats and your cheeses, you're only getting 42 calories of protein and you're getting 259 calories from fat. And then you can see what we have from milk, 32 and 42, and then lentils. Three and a half ounces of lentils are 32 calories from protein, three calories from fat, and 70 calories from carbohydrates. So when we look at um, the protein, meat, and, uh, and fat, and meat, and meat substitutes. This is a comparison. It's also interesting. Low-fat meat, 28, 27. Beef jerky, 64 calories from protein, 50 from fat. Beef bologna, 12 of protein, 75 of fat. Cheese, a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm doing myself a favor when I eat cheese. You get 28 grams of protein but you get 85 grams of fat, uh, of fat calories, that is. Nuts, uh, like almonds, 22 of protein, 131 of fat. Peanut butter, 32 and 144. And one hot dog only has 28 grams of protein in it. Uh, uh, rather, calories of protein, excuse me. Only 28 calories of protein, 147 calories from fat. So, proteins that heal. They are vegetable proteins. These are the proteins we really want to put into our diet. And a diet rich, uh, a whole foods plant-based diet is rich in protein and calories. Some vegetables, in fact, when you take them on a per calorie basis, are higher in protein per calorie than what steak is. And broccoli, for instance, is one of those. So the whole, on a whole food plant-based diet, you're going to get 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. And our minimum daily requirement is only between 20 and 35. Still a very ample supply of, of protein. And that is as opposed to the standard American diet where we have in excess of 100 grams of protein intake per day. So we don't have to worry, are we getting adequate amount of protein? All you have to do is worry, am I eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, and whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans, etc. And if you're eating a variety, you're going to get everything you need and then some. Plus, you're going to get this load of rich micronutrients, which is going to help quell the inflammation in your body and help reverse the underlying problems which are causing your diabetes. So what is our reversal strategy? Let's talk about that for a few moments. We want to go from have, being uh, a pe person with diabetes to being a person who's now diabetes free. You can wander all over the map to get there, but as you know, the straightest distance between two, I mean the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So based on the formula that Dr. Joel Furman gave us, he said your future health equals nutrients divided by calories. So Dr. Youngberg came along and he took this formula and uh, he, he started studying groups of foods and he pulled together those foods 
which were similar in type. He tested the amount of uh, uh, nutrients that were there, compiled all that information, compiled the information about the calories, and used this formula to create a health hierarchy. You'll be able to find that uh, um, list in your packet uh, of information that comes with the uh, DVD. But you'll notice that he starts out with first class foods and you have green leafy vegetables for beginners. These are just packed full of nutrients, but they're actually low in calories. And it's interesting to note that a person who eats one serving of green leafy vegetables, that's one cup of fresh green leafy vegetables, or it's one half cup of cooked green leafy vegetables. And we're talking about things like romaine, spinach, collards, turnip greens, etc. Those kind of foods, one serving a day decreases your instance of diabetes by 9%. Now, if you ask me, that is a huge difference for one little serving a day. Uh, and if it were up to me, I would be uh, jumping at the opportunity to have something green every day, and I do. Next category are green vegetables, things like green beans and asparagus, cucumbers and zucchini. All, the, all, all these type of vegetables are also very high in nutrients, packed with the nutrients, but they're low in calories, which make them a healing food and an anti-inflammatory food. And then you have your colored, colorful vegetables. These three, I think, are probably the three most important categories to be eating from because as a, a person who has diabetes, where your metabolic, the metabolic function in your body is not working right, you can actually eat unlimited amounts of these foods in the course of a day. You can eat till you're full and not be hungry. And uh, it will help with your diabetes as well. So it's a great option. And then you get on down to things like beans and legumes and starchy vegetables and your nuts and seeds, you know, your healthy fats and things of that nature. And as you move down the list, then he transitions to second class foods and finally third class foods on the bottom. So as we work this list, you go up the list, you have anti-inflammatory foods and you have healing foods. But as you move down to second class and then on to third class foods, they become more inflammatory as you work toward the bottom of the list, and they are also more harmful to your body. So get, get you a, uh, a food list, and you start working, trying to make the majority of your intake in the first class arena. If you're really serious about reversing, Let's get 80 to 85% of your intake in first class foods. Then you can make the balance of that up with second class foods and then leave the third class foods alone altogether. You'll uh, make the transition to being diabetes free very rapidly. So how can you get a hold of the food list? It should be available with this DVD in an accompanying CD and uh, it'll be a print version. There will also be a way that you can get it by email if you just simply email us at reversingdiabetesgrundy at gmail.com. You can get it there or go online, and this is probably a better option yet. Purchase Dr. Wes Youngberg's book, Goodbye Diabetes. It is chock full of wonderful information, and we'll give you another learning resource that you can turn to after you finish this course to help you know how to better reverse your disease. He has a lot to say that I am not able to say in this short program. There is also a one-day food plan included in your packet. Now, you know, when you go into the kitchen to bake a cake, every cook knows there's some basic ingredients that go into the cake. You're going to need flour, you're going to need sugar, you're going to need salt, you're going to need uh, some kind of uh, shortening or fat. And uh, so you pull all these ingredients out of your shelf and you assemble them on the counter and you start to put them in the bowl. And as you do, you realize that you don't have enough sugar. Instead of two and a half cups of sugar, all you have is one cup. Well, you say, well, that really doesn't matter. Salt looks like sugar, I can put salt in instead. The problem there, as you all know, is it's not going to turn out well. This is not going to be a cake that somebody enjoys. With diabetes reversal, when you're working these food lists, 
it's very much the same way. You can eat all first class foods, but if you eat them in the wrong combination or in the wrong quantities, if you're eating, say, lots of the high fat foods or lots of the foods that are uh, high in starches, you may not be able to achieve your goal of reversing your diabetes. So Dr. Youngberg has given us a one day food plan. And with that one day food plan, it will help you bring those things into focus. So just do that one, food, one day food plan over and over again, follow the, uh, the suggestions for servings and you'll get there. Make 85, 80 to 85% of your intake these first class foods. And just be sure that you increase your fiber grams slowly to where you're finally achieving a minimum of 40 to 45 grams of fiber a day. Yesterday I had two individuals at the Reversing Diabetes seminar that we taught who, had, who in three weeks were already up to where they were eating 80, uh, one of them had 81 grams of fiber for the day, the other had 71, and uh, neither of them had adverse effects because they went up slowly, and uh, both of them were experiencing decreased blood glucose levels. Very excited about their progress. So increase it slowly. Week one, you'll need to aim for 20 to 25 grams of fiber. Week two, you go 30 to 35 grams. Week three, do 40 to 45 grams. And remember, eat your fiber first. Eat your fiber foods at the beginning of the meal. Then avoid third class foods. These foods are the processed meats, refined grains, sweets, and diet sodas, probably the four highest categories of inflammatory foods that there are. Then uh, you'll want to go low fat. Eat your, eat your fats primarily from whole food sources, avoid sources of trans fats, and definitely avoid the saturated fats. Eat slowly. Uh, if you'll eat foods that require chewing, there's, uh, your body just likes to chew. And uh, it usually takes 20 to 25 minutes for you to have chewed enough to feel satisfied with the meal. So if you're eating very rapidly, you're packing lots of calories into your body, and you're not getting satisfied from your food. However, if you're eating slowly, you'll put less calories into your body. So slow down. Take time to talk to the people around the table. I hope you'll sit down to the table and enjoy that. Savor the flavors of the food. This is an adventure that you're going to be undergoing. And most of the people that I know, in fact, I know nobody that has said it was not worth it. They, uh, they, they're very happy with the changes that they bring into their life. Eat foods with high water content. This would be things like fresh fruits and vegetables, things like celery or fresh apple, or uh, though any food with a high water content Soups are a great option as well. Take a lentil soup, it's just a fantastic food for a diabetic. Then avoid overeating. Be mindful of what you're eating. Think about it. Instead of eating out of the bag, put the food on your plate, look at it. Consider the quantity that's there. Are you staying within the guidelines of portion sizes for, uh, from, from your one day eating plan? And drink eight to 10 glasses of water. Preferably, you'll do this not at meal times, but before the meals or uh, by, by at least half an hour before the meal or at least an hour after the meal. You will have better digestion from that and uh, uh, it will keep your body hydrated in between meals so you feel less hungry in between meals. Finally, we want to do exercise. We've talked about a 20 minute exercise after meals and burst training three to six times a week. Now, if you had to only pick two little items off this reversal plan, I would suggest to you that the two very most important were the, uh, the 80 to 85% first class foods that we saw right at the top of the list, and it will be the 20 minute exercise after every meal. This is critical because that timing allows it to pull down your insulin levels. You're a type 2 diabetic because you have developed insulin resistance. Or maybe you're not diabetic yet, but you have insulin resistance. You need to get that insulin level back down to normal so your body will be able to start losing some of this excess weight. 
It's storing the weight while those insulin levels are high. So that's critical. We are not exercising here for the sake of exercising or reversing cardiovascular disease or whatever. We are exercising in this time frame to lower our insulin levels. And that's why that's so critical. If it is impossible for you to exercise after all three meals during the day, please at least exercise after your supper meal of the day. That is the most important meal of the day in which to do your exercise. And then we have SMART goals. Paying attention to your health is extremely important. Take time to make sure that you've written out some specific SMART goals and uh, that you review them on a daily basis, that you set benchmarks so you'll know, am I achieving that goal? If I want to lose 20 pounds by Christmas and I have 20 weeks, that's one pound a week that I have to learn in order to have achieved my goal. Is it achievable? Yes. Is it specific? Yes. Is it measurable? Yes. Is it time bound? Yes. Is it realistic? Absolutely it is realistic. It's very possible. One of the most critical things you need to do is get your insulin level down and the weight will just drop off. In last night's class I had one lady she was eating according to the plan, she was drinking her water according to the plan, and she was exercising according to the plan. In one week, she was just shocked to realize that she had lost over four pounds. Why, she's 25% to the goal already in just one week. So, include time as well to learn how to reverse diabetes. I've given you already a couple references of books that I think are wonderful references to help you learn more about that. But the more you know, the better off you're going to be able to make choices in your life, choices which actually impact your health. L then let's be safe about what we do. Check your sugars often. If your doctor has recommended that you do them four times a day, don't go throughout the day and ignore that advice. It's very important because when you increase your exercise and you, you change what you eat like you're going to do in this program, then your sugars will begin falling. So please talk to your doctor, especially uh, talk to your doctor if you're taking insulins because your sugars can drop precipitously when you're on insulin or when you're on some, of the, some classes of certain drugs. So your doctor may want to take you off that and actually let your sugars run high. Uh, a lot of diabetics, the doctors actually will, that I work with, will put their patients on a sliding scale for their insulin. If your sugar is, when you check it in the morning, is 90 to 100, then he'll say, I want you to decrease your insulin take by, intake by so much. And he puts them on this sliding scale, gives them another type of insulin perhaps to take if it goes high during the course of the day. And it allows them to safely come off of their insulins when they do this. Keep healthy snacks available. There may be times that you become hypoglycemic. That means with a real low blood sugar, you feel shaky and whatever else. But I encourage you, in those times when you do feel shaky, before you actually take the snack, stop and pause a moment and just check your blood sugar. Because I've had many, many people that I care for that say, oh, I feel like my blood sugar's low. And I go in the room and I check their sugar and they may be 250. So test before you snack. And then notify your physician if you have any hypoglycemic episode. If your blood sugar falls uh, b below uh, 90 and you're taking insulins, you ought to let him know so he can adjust those insulins. If it falls below uh, 60 in any circumstance. I would certainly let him know so that he can adjust your medications. You're going to be wanting to come off the medications. That's why you're listening to this uh, set of DVDs. Weight loss is imperative if you're going to lose, uh, if you're going to reverse your diabetes. But a good goal is to lose one to two pounds a week. That way you're not losing muscle mass, you're just losing the fat. If you're doing your burst training, you're increasing the fat burning capacity in your body. If you're drinking the water, you're helping flush those things out of there. You're eating less calories and you're, you're exercising, your body is going to respond very well and you'll be able to lose your weight. Then make your health goal, your ultimate health goal, to achieve an ideal body weight. 
when almost 70% of our population is either overweight or obese, it's awfully easy for us to feel like, well, I'm really okay. My BMI is 28. You may not necessarily be, be below your uh, fat threshold, and your diabetes might not reverse at that level. Your optimal health will come somewhere after you have actually achieved your ideal body weight. So work hard for getting there. Get in shape, and, uh, but do it in doable increments. Let's not look at the fact that I might have to lose 120 pounds. Let's look at the fact that I'm going to lose one pound this week and one pound next week, and by Christmas I'm going to lose 20 pounds. You're well on your way to achieving your goal. And if you lose one to two pounds a week in just a little over a year, and certainly less than a year and a half, you will have achieved your goal of that 120 pounds. You will be a new person, and you will be thankful that you took the time to um, take a before picture. The One Day Food Plan, this is a picture of what you'll see. It's in your packet there. Please refer to it. It tells you how many servings a day. It tells you what the serving size is and often gives you uh, ideas of what kind of foods to include there. This is very flexible. Use it over and over again. It's easy to learn. It's a whole lot easier than carb counting. And uh, um, enjoy the process of reversing your diabetes. Now I want to ask you a question. We've talked about in the lectures so far, far, we've talked about a variety of the benefits and the uh, costs of your course of action. Now think about this for a minute. If you're trying to reverse your disease, is it really worth it to you? If you stay the course and allow your doctor to help you control your symptoms, what you can look forward to is neuropathy pain. You can look for amputations. You can look for kidney disease. Many of you will develop eye problems. You will be highly susceptible to stroke and may spend the rest of your life in a nursing home. Or you may have heart disease that will definitely shorten the length of your life. So if that's worth it to you, continue the course that you've been on and don't make the changes. But if you think it might be worth it to you to make these changes, what you're going to reap as a benefit of that is longer life, lower blood pressure, lower blood sugar, increased health, increased energy, and increased vitality. I hope that you will make the choice in favor of all these. For me, it was absolutely worth it. And I am feeling better and better every day as I have worked to reverse my prediabetes. Your SMART goals should be specific. They should be measurable. They should be attainable. They should be realistic. And they should be time bound. While you're still sitting there watching this video, why don't you reach for that piece of paper and begin writing down your very health goals. You can put this on pause so you can keep these words on the screen to help remind you of what you need to do. Or pull out the uh, SMART goal sheet that is in the packet and fill that out. Then put it in a prominent place. Pray over it and let God help you make the changes in your life that are going to be, give you the health that you really desire.